For those of you on the call, welcome to our webinar. We'll be starting in about one minute. Just want to give everyone time to connect. We appreciate your patience. I just want to reiterate for those of you connecting right now, welcome to the webinar and we'll be starting in about one minute. We just wanna give everyone time to connect. We're one minute past the hour, so we're gonna get started. Welcome everyone. My name is Nadia Stakowitz. I'm the Senior Product Manager of Clinical Applications for Viar Medical Respiratory Diagnostics. And you've joined our webinar discussion, ERS ATS PFT Interpretation Standards, What's New? It's great to have you all on this webinar. I do have a few housekeeping items to review. We, of course, respect your time and want to make sure you hear the speakers clearly. So as a result, all attendees will be placed on mute. Of course, I'm sure there's going to be questions as we progress through the topic. So anytime during the live presentations that you have a question, please feel free to enter the question into the chat box. Time will be also allocated at the end to respond to those questions. For those of you on the webinar wishing to receive CEUs, you will receive an email from Viair with a survey that you'll need to complete in order to receive those CEUs, so please be on the lookout for that. So with that said, I'm delighted to introduce Dr. Sonia Stanoyev and Stanojevic and Dr. Marko Topolovic. Welcome doctors. Dr. Sonia Stanojevic is an assistant professor in the Department of Community Health and Epidemiology at Dalhousie University. Dr. Stanojevic is a respiratory epidemiologist with expertise and methodologies to characterize the normal growth and development of the lungs. She chairs the ERS Global Lung Function Initiative Network and is vice chair of the ATS Pulmonary Function Testing Proficiency Standards Committee. She also recently co-chaired the ERS ATS Standard for Pulmonary Function Test Interpretation. Welcome Dr. Stanojevic. Dr. Topolovic is a CEO of Arctic from Leuven, Belgium, a company that aims to empower medical professionals with artificial intelligence to accurately and timely diagnose, treat, and monitor patients with lung diseases. Formerly as a postdoctoral researcher in the University Hospital in Leuven, Marco worked on inventing algorithms for assessing lung disease. He obtained a PhD degree on this topic, artificial intelligence for pulmonary function tests at the KU Leuven. His scientific work has contributed to many peer reviewed publications and numerous conference presentations. And moreover, he received several international awards. So without further delay, Dr. Stanoyevich will start the presentation. Thank you so much, Nadia, for that wonderful introduction. And thank you all for joining today. Um, I look forward to the questions at the end. So I'm sure there will be lots. It's, feel free to put them in the Q&A as we go along. <clears throat> so I'll just start. I can, there we go. Uh, I was just declaring some conflicts. Um, one obvious being that I do chair the Global Lung Function Initiative, which represents an academic conflict. Um, and I received some funding from industry unrelated to this work. So today we're here to talk about the new interpretation standard. So many of you will be familiar with the 2005 standard and our update of interpretation strategies coincides with an update of all of the ERS ATS PFT standards. So in 2019, we updated spirometry in 2017 DLCO and the lung volume standard is forthcoming very shortly. Over the last three years, I've had the privilege of working with a renowned group of individuals from all over the world who have really helped to shape how we use pulmonary function testing in their own research and practice. Um, and it was a delight to be able to learn from these individuals and work with them to, to present to you the updated technical standards. So I'll start with the conclusions first. I think our key messages that we want to get across with the new document is that interpretation of pulmonary function tests is incredibly useful in, in the practice of, of respiratory medicine. We know that they're critical to both the diagnosis and, and management of people with respiratory disease. 
but we must start to acknowledge that there is a large degree of uncertainty when it comes to understanding measures of pulmonary function. We also have to take into consideration that when we compare measurements to a reference population, we have to appreciate the limitations of that reference population and whether or not it's appropriate for the people that are being tested. Importantly, we have to put the results in context of that individual who's coming to the lab for a test. So thinking about why somebody has been referred for a pulmonary function test and how those results relate to their a priori reasons for being there, so their symptoms or clinical presentation. And perhaps most important, rather than relying on a single measure of lung function, we need to do better at incorporating multiple measurements in the same individual and understanding how someone's lung function changes over time rather than relying on a single measurement. And so as we look to, to update how we use PFTs and how we interpret them, I think we have to become a little bit more comfortable with accepting that pulmonary function measurements have an inherent biological variability. There's a measurement error of the tests and the devices that we use. There's biological variability within individuals and also between individuals. We also, right at the beginning of our document, outline that there are three distinct stages to interpretation. I'm going to spend a little bit of time just telling you about these three stages and why you'll notice in the updated document we don't talk at all about a clinical diagnosis or assign any clinical labels to, to what we've derived. So our first step when we think about measured me values of lung function is we have to look at how that individual measurement compares to what we would expect in otherwise healthy individuals and then whether that measurement is within that range that we would expect in healthy individuals or not. We use pulmonary function tests and not just spirometry, but the suite of pulmonary function tests that we have available to us to characterize the physiological phenotypes, which then can help to inform what diagnosis or management should take place. That third and final step of making a clinical decision, whether it be diagnostic or to change treatment or management, is independent of pulmonary function test interpretation. In order to make that clinical decision, we need to have both the pulmonary function test results, but also the information about that individual patient, because as I mentioned at the beginning, incorporating that pretest probability is integral to making the right diagnosis for the person that's sitting in front of you. And so that's why you'll see in the updated document, we don't talk about any clinical diagnoses and really focus on the physiology and what the pulmonary function test is telling us about how the lungs function. Now, many of you are familiar with the measured values. So in any instance where we can compare an individual to themselves, we have a much stronger approach and, and you can get much more information. So for example, if we're measuring the same person on two, on, within the same test occasion, it's far more informative to compare their values. So that's an example of bronchodilator response. If we have an individual where the test interval is very short, so if we're looking at a trial of therapy or we're looking at somebody over a short period of time where we don't have anticipated impacts of growth or aging, comparing an individual to their previous measurement, again, is far more useful to know whether or not the changes that are observed are important for that individual. And in a rare instance where we might have um, a baseline value for an individual, particularly in adults, where you can compare to where someone was in early adulthood or at the early stages of their disease, and that's going to be far more informative. But unfortunately, if you're dealing with children or if it's the first time that you've measured someone, having just a measure of someone's measured lung function, like in this example of 2.7 liters, is really not very informative unless you know more about that individual. We know that, my slides work. Whoop. Okay, so we know that um, men and women of the same standing height, men will have larger lung volumes than, than women. We know that two individuals of different heights, taller individuals will just have bigger lungs. And similarly, we know that there are strong effects of aging so that as people age, the strength of their chest wall muscles, the rigidity of their chest wall all changes with the normal aging process and their lung 
function measurements will also be influenced. And it's for these reasons, the fact that lung function is so highly variable between individuals based on their biological sex, their height, and their age, that we use reference equations to help us understand whether that measured value of 2.7 liters is representative of what we would expect in a similar individual that's otherwise healthy. And so one of the changes in the new interpretation standard is that we've recommended the Global Lung Function Initiative reference equations for all three of our most commonly used tests. And this is distinct from the 2005 standards where for North America, the NHANES reference equations were recommended for spirometry and really numerous other equations were presented for our other lung function tests and, and there were no standards set for the rest of the world. So just a little bit about the GLI. So the Global Lung Function Initiative combined data from more than 75,000 individuals from around the world. We were able to create four distinct population-specific reference equations, which I'll talk a little bit about more as the talk goes on. And importantly, we created all age equations. So rather than having separate equations for your young children, adolescent children, early adulthood, late adulthood, rather than having different equations for TLCO and lung volumes, what we have now is a seamless suite of equations that are all based on the same methodology, that are all interconnected and allow us to have a single standard. Although TLCO and lung volumes reference equations are based on a much smaller sample size than the spirometry equations, all three represent the largest collection of reference or reference or healthy data that we've ever compiled across the world. In addition to talking about having all age equations, the other key distinction of the GLI is that we characterize the variability of measurements between individuals across the age span, such that instead of having a fixed lower limit of normal, such as 80% predicted, that's applied uh, just undiscreetly to all lung function measurements, we now have outcome-specific, age-specific lower limits of normal that provide us with greater summarization or better summarization of that inherent biological variability of these pulmonary function tests. I will comment that although the GLI equations represent a significant advantage to, to what was summarized in the 2005 standard, importantly, none of these reference equations, GLI, NHANES, or any of that are published, really represent an ideal standard of what our lungs should look like if we had no negative exposures. They are a reference population. We use very general criteria for what we call health. So if you're a non-smoker without a doctor diagnosis of respiratory disease, and this is part of the reason why we see so much variability in our reference populations, because those two criteria don't adequately capture the vast diversity of, of risk factors that we know influence how our lungs grow and develop all the way through the life course. And so you'll see in this is schematic that standing height, age, and sex are only some of the factors that contribute to how our lungs develop during childhood and how our lungs function during, um, during adulthood. And because our standard or our reference equation inclusion criteria don't account for all of these complex influences, they don't provide us with necessarily a standard of what our lungs should be, and we may be missing important um, effects of some of these variables. I also want to highlight that marginalized communities, not just in North America, but all around the world are disproportionately influenced by things like air, uh, poor air quality and structural racism, poor nutrition. And these are all factors that may also help to explain some of the very the differences that we see between these populations. Now, with the advances in using the methodology that we use to derive the GLI equations, we also highlight that having a single fixed lower limit of normal, such as 80% predicted or using the 70.7 uh, for the ratio of FEV1 and FEC, potentially misses these important age-related changes. And so I'm not expecting anyone to, to join me in a statistic lecture today, but I just wanna highlight that one of the things that we introduce is this normal range. So rather than looking at an individual measure and whether it's above or below 80% predicted, most manufacturers now include these pictograms where we can visualize where along the spectrum of healthy individuals someone might lie. And so if an individual measurement is in that zone that we would expect in otherwise healthy individuals, 
we have more confidence of where they are relative to that healthy population. And as somebody's lung function comes out of that normal range, we can appreciate the magnitude or how far that observed value is from what we would expect in the healthy individual. And so it's another tool that tells us about that uncertainty of the measurements or the biological variability of the population. And most reports now will have this pictogram alongside your quantitative criteria, including your percent predicted. Now, one of the reasons why I wanted to spend a little bit of time introducing Z-scores is what you'll notice in the new interpretation standard is that we've now also anchored severity to, to these Z-score values. So previously, where we had percent predicted base cutoffs, these were based on data in spirometry, but apply to every single other lung function measure indiscriminately. Here, what we introduce are now three levels of severity that are anchored to Z-scores, which remove some of the age-related vi variability or bias that we observe when we use percent predicted. And where you'll see the biggest effects is in those older individuals who will be now classified as less severe than they were previously. Another big change is our bronchodilator criteria. Now, I have to admit this was the most contentious um, recommendation that we had to come up with. And what we observed was that there is a lot of heterogeneity in the percentage of people with either a doctor diagnosis of asthma or COPD that had a bronchodilator response or vice versa. So there, while the bronchodilator response is used to differentiate between an asthma or COPD phenotype, we found that there was very little literature to support that. Part of the reason that we've observed this is because there were age, sex, and height-related biases in using the old criteria that was included in the 2005 standard. And so what we propose is rather than comparing pre-post bronchodilator results to somebody's pre-bronchodilator values, the big change is that these are now compared to the predicted value for that individual. And what we've seen is that this helps to minimize that age, height, and sex bias that was observed with the previous criteria. Another important change is looking at how much change is clinically significant. As I mentioned at the start of my talk, this is perhaps the most useful way that we can use lung function measurements. Yet when we look at where the previous recommendations came from, we find there was very little evidence to support that. So the 2005 standard that said a, a change of more than 12% between two test occasions was considered clinically significant comes to you from studies in the 1980s that included 10 smokers and 10 non-smokers. What we see when we look at a large number of individuals, this is healthy data of over 10,000 individuals measured on more than 70,000 test occasions. So on the left, you have health. On the right-hand side, you have a CF population. And we see that in otherwise healthy individuals, there's a very strong bias that's influenced by the, someone's baseline measurement. So the lower your lung function is to start, the more likely you are to, to improve at your next visit. And the higher your lung function is at the beginning, the more likely you are to have a drop in that lung function. And so for interpreting changes over time, at least in children, we recommend something called a conditional Z-score that takes into account both the age of the child, the time interval between measurements, and accounts for the baseline starting value. Now in adults, we don't have that same wealth of data on repeated measurements. And also we might use adult measures of lung function slightly differently. And so for adults, what we propose, which has been studied in just a few studies, but we still think there's probably a lot of value in thinking about this, is something called the FEV1Q. So unlike everything else that we do in pulmonary function, where we compare to the healthy population or how someone is relative to that healthy population, FEV1Q allows us to track how somebody is from how far somebody is from the lower limit of normal. So if we take a, a disease population and look at the lower limit that you would think is compatible with life, we actually then look to see how far someone is from that lower range. And what we see that this is a very quite robust measure that doesn't change very much over a long period of time. And what we can see is that individuals who have a significant deterioration in their FEV1Q will change by more than what we would expect in health. Generally, over a 20-year period, we expect your FEV1Q to drop by one unit. So when we divide that up into the annual measurements, changes that are greater than 0.1 or 0.2 of an FEV1Q are considered clinically significant. And there's some promising research coming out further supporting both of these two uh, approaches to interpreting changes over time. 
And I'll just finish before I hand over to Marco, highlighting, I think one of the biggest values of the updated uh, PFT interpretation standard is thinking about how we use lung function measurements to classify the physiological impairment. So rather than focusing on just a single value and how that relates to the healthy population, really thinking about characterizing the underlying physiology to help us make more informed clinical decisions. And so we've updated the um, PFT algorithms as they were considered. So we still start with spirometry using FEV1, FVC ratio as our key differentiator. But one thing that you'll notice is that if somebody has suspected or possible restriction, we're recommending that additional lung volumes be measured. Now, this doesn't mean that everybody with a low FEC should be referred for, for lung volumes measurement. Again, in somebody with an a priori pre-test probability of having a restrictive lung function impairment would be the individuals that if they had a low FEC would then also be um, referred for, for lung volumes testing. And this is an area where, again, you need to think about clinical judgment in terms of where um, there may be possible restriction that needs to be confirmed with the lung volumes measurement. Within lung volumes, the other big change is that we uh, differentiate simple and complex restrictive patterns, providing further information in terms of how we can use measurements of lung volumes to help us differentiate different um, physiological profiles. And there weren't very many changes with DLCO, other than that I'll highlight that we don't have strict criteria in terms of what's considered a high and low um, VEA and KCO, because really it depends on the individual context. And more alarmingly is that there's very few studies that have actually been used to support the, the recommendations that were included in the 2005 statement. And so when we look for evidence-based approaches to interpretation, we find that there aren't a lot of strong studies of any study does all to help us to, to differentiate these, further emphasizing our need to really think holistically about the person that's being tested and how the three measures of lung function using these most commonly used tests help us to differ differentiate different pathophysiologies. And so I'll, I'll summarize with the conclusions that I've started with. We need to think about the reference population that's being used, how appropriate that is for the population that you're testing the reasons why someone is there for the pulmonary function test and what that tells you about how you can use that information to help inform that interpretation. And wherever possible, tracking someone over time is gonna provide you with much more information than relying on a single measure. And so again, our take home message is that we need to be more thoughtful of the inherent biological variability, the uncertainty of pulmonary function measures. And while that doesn't mean that pulmonary function measurements aren't useful, it's just that we, we need to be more cognizant of those variability measures to help make better decisions for, for individual patients. And with that, I'll, I'll close and hand over to Marco for his half. Thanks so much. Thank you, Dr. Stanoyevich. Thank you, Sonia. You see my screen now? Just say yes or no, yeah. But thank you, Sonia. Thank you for the nice introduction and setting up the tone of, the, of this presentation as well. Thank you, Nadia, as well, for uh, and whole wire team for the opportunity to be here. Um, also, thank you everyone who is uh, behind their computers and listening this uh, this webinar today. Uh, following, um, as Nadia said, my name is Mark Topalovic, and I'm pleased to be here and to introduce you the impact of this new guideline that we analyzed. Uh, that's going to have on the, on the practice and on the data, and also to introduce you the way we are looking at uh, by using the artificial intelligence. So before. Um, before I uh, continue, I would like to also quickly disclose that I'm the CEO and co-founder of Arctic. Uh, it's a spin-off of the university in Belgium, but um, which is the which came out as the result of the, the the eight years of the research that we have in our laboratory on different AI applications, always in the respiratory medicine, uh, and also in the US, we are the partners of the Wire Medical, and I guess that's why we are here as well on this webinar. Um, so to start. Um, new interpretation standards have just been published, so almost uh, 17 years since the previous ones. So, and they're introducing additional complexity and new terminologies. So, I'm, I'm not going to go into 
each of these terminologies because I'm signing to use them. But from, from let's say, the, the regular perspective, it looks more complex than the previous ones. And, but it doesn't look impossible, let's say. So it's pretty intuitive if you look at it, and uh, but still can um, lead to some mistakes. And we are trying to simplify them, to simplify that. So if you compare them, let's see what were the old ones and what the new ones are, are bringing in. So in the old ones, we had uh, four different categories, four different groups, and we had to follow a certain simple decision tree to get to the right label. Well, well, severities had five different groups and they were based on a certain threshold, which was on the percent predicted. And if you look to the new ones, we have much more labels now, much more groups. And, and the, the question is, is it for the better or for the worse? Uh, and um, we also have different different way of looking into severities. As, as Sina said, this is now based on the Z course to account for the for the for the age, for the height, and for the gender as well of the other people. So we, we started actually asking ourselves, what is the impact of these new guidelines? So what does this mean for the practice and for the patients? And can we link this these new theoretical rules uh, with uh, the, the, out, the patient outcomes? So we set up the study where we aim to investigate how these recently published uh, standards for the lung function interpretation affects uh, patients' classification compared to the previous one. So we took we took a data set sorry, of 1,323 patients, mainly Caucasians with good, good range of all ages and uh, diseases, and uh, majority of the people were also smokers. Uh, we took uh, a quite variable data set to ensure that we had quite some diseases present to be able to challenge uh, the, the guidelines in all different parts of the, the, the complex decision trees that are coming. Um, and when we look into the when we look into the results, we could see that patients who were previously uh, classified as normal cases, now 90% of them stayed normal, but 10% of these patients uh, got the new label, which is uh, the restrictive, which mainly goes to the simple restriction. If you look for the mixed cases, nothing changed. Who was mixed, stayed mixed. Uh, if you look to the obstructive cases, now we see that in this particular data set, 88% of the sub cases remain obstructive, whereas 12% uh, uh, became uh, non-specific, which is a new group, and 2% uh, uh, mixed cases. And all of obviously restrictive patients now went to the two groups, the simple restrictive, which was more prevalent, 69%, and the complex restrictive, which was uh, 31%. So if we look, quite some, quite, quite some people got new labels. So actually, 26-27% uh, of the people uh, became, got the new label, and we wanted to look what is really behind with these people who got the new label which disease they have. And if you look now to these people who used to be normal, now became restrictive, 87% of, uh, of these subjects actually have already ILD. So this is the mild stage of, of the interstitial lung disease. Um, if you look to the, the group of non-specific cases, uh, this is the group of quite, let's say patients who were really non-specific. So uh, yes, some a lot of them were stupid in asthma, but all other diseases were present present in this group, and that was majority. And if you look to the the new new rules of a new uh, label of uh, simple restriction, we see that majority of these people were ILD, which was as well what was expected based on the guidelines. And the complex restriction now uh, is a is a split between the neuromuscular diseases and interstitial lung diseases, and obviously. Uh, even though it's the uh, same proportion, actually, no, uh, the number of neuromuscular diseases in this group were lower, so that's that's why the significance of them is, is bigger. So all in all, uh, when we see there's a lot of similarities between the new guidelines, but still we see it also improved granularity due to these new patterns. So they describe better what, what is really happening with the patients. Um, if you look to the severities, we um, see that uh, there is a shift towards the milder severities. So this is uh, definitely due to age-related things or due to that scores. Uh, regard that was the, the severity for the obstruction. If you look to the severity for the restriction, so that's uh, there is no really um, obvious trend here 
because uh, the previous guidelines were uh, more on the FEVC, FV1 percent predicted, whether um, there is no clarity, but um, just suggestion that we should follow the TLC for um, for them in the new guidance for the restriction severity uh, of restriction. If you look to the, the new uh, bronchodilator response uh, definition, we see that almost all of the patients who used to be insignificant um, now remain insignificant, whereas 27% um, of the patients who used to be have a significant response on the droplet later now are going to be uh, labeled as uh, insignificant. So that's a, that's a big number of patients, I would say. So the new broken related uh, response definition accounts for the impact of this low base on FE1, which results in a stringent way to classify uh, the change. Um, we also we also decided to take a look whether this new complexity also has any impact on the, the on the interpretation. So how much time does somebody take to interpret these results? So we we took we asked two experts with more than 10 years of experience in the in lung function testing to um, to look into the new guidelines, to have them available in front of them and and take one hour of their time. And let's see how, how many of the, the lung function tests they're going to be able to uh, interpret. So uh, for clarity, they had some of the, the patient tests were only spirometry. Sometimes they had a full PFT. Sometimes they did have a broken later, sometimes they didn't. So there's a variety of different tests available. So what we what we saw that these two experts, uh, one expert managed to interpret 15 tests in um, in this one hour, which means four minutes for one test, which came to um, let's say with a high accuracy of around 90 percent for each, for each interpretation, and the expert two managed to uh, interpret a bit more 19, but that came at the price of having an average accuracy of 70 percent and not interpreting uh, the severities in, in that time frame. So um, I have a couple of conclusions during these slides. The first conclusion is what is really changing. So we are seeing uh, the, 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 the implementation of this new uh, ATS, ATS series 21 um, interpretation guidelines will result in a more elaborated description of pattern and more scientifically correct uh, injunction of the disease severity and reversibility labels. Uh, although it will not in fact affect um, the, the clinical work for workup and therapeutic strategies in majority of the patients, um, a large subgroup may shift from class with different therapeutic options. So absence or presence of visibility in CFPD RASPA may lead to new diagnostic labels and shift in uh, the treatments with the ICS. And we may see also we also for the for the antifer specific antiprobiotic drugs in the ILD, for instance, are prescribed for certain uh, severity classes, so which may shift with the new classifications to um, situations in which treatment can no longer um, prolong. Um, what's the impact on the clinical practice? So we are gonna, we are seeing definitely more precision, so more detailed and accurate uh, description of the lung function. But as I said, this interpretation becomes more complex, that there's a price of uh, time consuming, and uh, there's going to be some errors as well due to that. Um, one of the interesting things that as well, um, new guidelines are introducing, they're introducing the future of the pulmonary function test interpretation, which is the artificial intelligence. And, and the authors are also uh, discussing whether the, the that softwares based on AI and or machine learning may also provide more accurate and standardized interpretations in the future. So um, to prolong, to continue on that discussion, I would just like to introduce a little bit of definitions. So the AI is actually a broad term. So that's a technology of building uh, smart machines, computer programs to perform tasks. And in general, that in general uh, need human intelligence. That's a very broad term, so we, we use it when we want to give the examples of some rule-based systems or decision support. Um, the machine learning itself, that's a subset of the AI, so that's specific, um, spe uh, let's say more narrow term, and technology that's a, that reflects technology that learns directly from the data, 
and its performance improves over the time due to exposure to more data and by acquiring new experiences from those data. And then some, we also hear a lot about the deep learning in, uh, in today's world, and that's a subset again of the machine learning, which is again technology that is usually applied when we learn from vast amount of different data that is required. Um, Acquired. So, um, so basically, take it together. The future of PFT interpretation seems to be as well uh, connected with some in, uh, automation or using the AI uh, in the process. So, uh, this automation with um, automated interpretation can support the clinical team. That's what we are seeing, and uh, by simplifying this complex interpretation, and that's that's what we are also developing ourselves. So because this will offer a certain consistency, so that means we're consistent with the guidelines, we're consistent between the colleagues, we are consistent between different sites and departments. There's a certain time efficiency as well. So um, we're going to spend less time on reporting itself uh, and we would allow more uh, for patient specific uh, information and spe patient specific time. And we will as well help reducing the waiting time as well, maintaining the quite high quality standards. And again, these two technologies could offer additional insights and support. So uh, for those reasons, we developed uh, the AI software that will tackle this uh, PFT interpretation. Um, so um, that kind of software provides the, the, the classical protocol. So it's automation of these new guidelines and which is basically the, this broad term of the AI that I mentioned previously. And the second, the, the, the core intelligence is the machine learning part of the software, which is, which is link, learning how to link the data coming from the PFT machine which, with certain disease. So actually looking for the fingerprint that each disease leaves on one function testing. And once, once, it's, um, once it's certain, we, we try to, we, with the highest probability, we try to conclude what's the most probable disease that is also present. So we published this, um, some time ago uh, in the ERJ, the paper around the impact of this. So now I also want to go back how and, and turn to um, how much, what's the impact if we give the same task of interpreting these tests to the AI, what we did with the two experts. So uh, we applied this, the same criteria, we, we the same new newest guidelines, the, the same data that the experts were seeing, and we saw that in one hour the AI was able to interpret five thousand tests, and we it was always in line with the guidelines because it's a rule based system, and with the rule based once you give the rules to the to the computer, that's um it's always going to repeat the same, so it's always going to be consistent and accurate. Um, it's nice as well to reflect on the previous studies that we had. So with the previous guidelines, so um, we we did a study in 16 hospitals across five countries in Europe, and we gave 50 tests uh, to doctor experts to interpret, and we saw that for the 50 tests, still doctor took around 150 minutes, which is a three minutes per test, and still all 120 experts had still had uh, quite some. Um, three out of four actually um, accurate interpretations by only saying obstructive, restrictive, mixed, or or normal. And on the other features, as I said, diagnostic suggestion, AI also managed to um, outperform um, the 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 accuracy that the experts were managed to pull out after um, pulmonary function tests. And that that was seen in all different diseases that were present. However, I don't want to finish this presentation by emphasizing AI, AI, AI. I actually think that's a, that's a classical mistake that that we are that we are seeing in the in the in the, in the news or in uh, in the papers. It's it should never be classical comparison one against the other. So that's just to uh, benchmark the accuracy. It should always be one with another. So we believe that actually the future is in the teamwork. So. Uh, we presented this on the last ERS in September in Barcelona that, that uh, the doctors who were using the AI software managed to always outperform themselves when they're not using the AI software, so um, in the diagnostic accuracy. So basically, the conclusion is that collaboration is superior in any way. So the teamwork should succeed. And the final conclusions that uh, I want to end my presentation with is that 
with is that artificial intelligence is a fast, reliable, and efficient method to accurately interpret pulmonary function tests independently on which guidelines it looks at. And the AI-based software provides a powerful decision support system in a day-to-day -day, um, clinical practice. Thank you very much. Thank you, Marco. Thank you, Sonia. Um, we are getting some really great questions. Um, so I will just kind of in order that I'm seeing them and perhaps even a question or two that I have, um, we'll have time for. Um, so someone asked, you know, there was a large gap of around 17 years between these standards and the older ones. And so was, what was the driving force to change these? Yeah, that's an excellent question. So almost immediately after the 2005 standard was published, um, there started to be evidence presented that challenged some of the, the decisions and some of the uh, recommendations. And over the course of 17 years, we saw more and more evidence that perhaps that um, it was time for an update. I think the other thing is Marco very nicely pointed out because there was some ambiguity in the 2005 standards, what ended up happening was that individual um, pulmonary societies or individual labs kind of tailored the interpretation to their own interpretation of the standard. And so what we saw was a big divergence in terms of how those standards were being applied in practice. And so the 17 years, I would say, is more of a practicality than anything. I think if any of us wanted to, we would have updated them much sooner. And one of the things that we're implementing now is, is we're not going to wait another 17 years. So as new evidence comes along, we're going to try to have um, more frequent updates where we can have evidence-based suggestions for how to further improve interpretation of PFTs. Very good. Um, we have another um, attendee who is asking, are there minimum requirements related to accuracy of the interpretations? Because um, there does seem to be significant variability in the examples between shown between providers. So I can, I can, I, maybe Marco, we can both answer this one. So I think that's one of the biggest challenges is that, you know, even if we, we apply the standards that we, we just published, we can use quantitative criteria and, and just say someone above or below this threshold. And, and that's what the algorithms do. And so you can, of course, if you have that, you can, you can standardize the interpretation. And then we don't need humans to tell us whether it's above or below a certain number. I think the challenge is, again, because we've all been trained differently and also the individual sitting in front of you, you may make a decision to call something mildly obstructive if you have more information about that person than if it's just a test that you've looked at. And so as, as we evolve in this field, I think it's really important that we do set a minimum standard, that we do have better training and opportunities to, to standardize this, because I think what's happening right now is depending on where you get tested and who interprets your results, you could have wildly different um, diagnostics, treatment decisions, and all the things that follow based on um, several aspects of the interpretation that was applied. Marco, you probably have an opinion too. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Uh, so it, I believe that this introduced complexities, highlighting that the standards are based on the consensus, what Sanya was also trying to, I guess, answer. So there is a, actually, there's not a lot of people doing the research to improve the interpretation. And the task force also figured out the gaps and stated that we might see, you know, Try, try to articulate in these guidelines the, all those gaps and what the research is doing. And I think what we did, let's say with the impact analysis, we tried, that's a way to measure, in my view, the accuracy of those standards. Um, are, they, are, are they improving or not? Yeah. No, no. I, be, I believe yes. I believe yes. I mean, this is what we accidentally prove. <laughs> Very good. Um... So another um, attendee is asking, um, percent predicted, it's not recommended any in this new interpretation standard. Um, so should we remove it from reports and focus on Z-score and LLN only? Um, I'll get in a lot of trouble if I make you remove uh, percent predicted from, from the report. So 
Here's what I think. I think percent predicted is incredibly intuitive. So when we're trying to explain the results to individuals, um, it, it tells us a lot. It, it's, a, it's a clear way for the patients to understand what the results are. I think the challenge to percent predicted is when we use the percent predicted cutoffs indiscriminately across age. So intuitively, I know people will say, well, 30% predicted, that's way worse than a 20-year-old than in, an, in a 70-year-old. And, and, and so people have applied that when they're, they're making decisions. The challenge is that you have to have that knowledge to then know that it's worse than a 30-year-old. And so when you look at Z scores, it allows you to take into account that age-related variability. And that Z score will be more severe for that 30-year-old compared to that 70-year-old. And so I think for, for the short term, there's an opportunity to use the two complementary. And that's why I think a lot of manufacturers have done that successfully by having the pictogram where you can visualize where somebody is. Um, and then you have the percent predicted as well. Certainly for severity, there will be a lot of changes. And so moving away from just the same percent predicted criteria for FEV1 for all of our impairments and, and having an outcome specific impairment gradient, I think will help to, to tell us more about the, the lung function impairment than what we had previously. Okay. Um, I, I like this question um, because you know we know that in the, the technical standards of the measurement applications, they often reiterate that, you know, the clinician expertise should always override whatever the computer is saying, right? And as a former um, clinician in that space myself, I completely agree with that. So someone is asking, um, and this again is probably a, a, a Marco and you question, Sonia, does AI use any visual reviews of the graphics? Does it work as long as all of the ATS ERS guidelines are met? And how does it deal with severe disease patients who don't always meet those because their lab, they're saying, we don't always throw those results away. Maybe I'll go very quickly. And I think it's, it's as you say, Nadia, it's in the, we always say, you know, use your judgment. Mm -hmm. um, in the 2019 spirometry standards, we've included something called a usability measure so that even if you don't meet the, the technical standards, there may be important information in the PFT that could inform a clinical decision. Um, but Marco, you can you can share about test quality and other aspects when it comes to AI. Yeah, thank you, Sanya. So uh, I, I I didn't put that into this presentation because that this was uh, let's say um, interpretation guidance. But we we also published a paper a couple of years two years ago in the ERJ about AI and the quality control of the of the spirometry. So basically. Um, mimicking the human experience and looking into the quality of the data. So that's a, that's, that's a, that, that is as well an important aspect, actually the most important aspect in order to continue and, and, and make some decisions with the data. But in general, as, as in every, every um, PFT lab, we would, even the AI relies on, uh, on the final decision made by the technician. So whether the data were in good quality or not. So, okay. so it's so not, the, it doesn't reject something. No, like today, today it does not reject because we, we, we need to take into account the decision as well made by the technician that that was the best possible uh, uh, tests made uh, capable of, of reproducing with that specific patient. Okay, very good. Um, another question, um, I like this one. How do you grade severity of restrictive ventilatory impairment? FEV1 Z score, TLC Z score, FEC Z score? That's right. So in the in the new standard, and this is what our where people's questions are excellent. So it's not explicit, but what we what we recommend if you're looking at uh, restrictive impairment, then the TLC Z score will give you information about the impairment of, of restrictive pattern. If we're using TLCO or DLCO, then we should be using the Z scores for that. I think that's one of the challenges previously we used FEV1 to describe the impairment for any of the different uh, classifications. And, and that's where I think we can, we can do better. Okay. Um, race and lung function has been a major point of debate in the literature. And we know that there is a new global equation that has just been published for the uh, spirometry from GLI. 
So without delving into the larger pros and cons of including race, this individual is curious to know why the ATS ERS fall allowed for inclusion of race within equations, but came out unequivocally, unequivocally against using a fixed correction factor. So thank you for this really important question. I know we only had 20 minutes, so I couldn't go into <laughs> th to this uh, very important question. So, so as you heard in this presentation and what you saw in the standard, I think historically, we have observed differences in populations in lung function between populations around the world. So when we when we compare individuals of different geographical ancestry or living in different parts of the world, we see differences. And our historical approach has been to, to have population or ethnic racial specific reference equations, because we assumed that those differences were biological, whether it be standing height to sitting height or chest size, whether it be um, individual genetic differences. And, and we did this in a way to, to minimize disparities because what we saw in the 1970s was people were being discriminated from employment and jobs because we were comparing everybody to the white European reference equations that existed then. I think as we critically evaluate the science and the evidence, those differences that we observe between populations around the world are not only biological, they're explained by the environment that we lived in. We're, they're explained by the systemic um, disparities that are embedded in our, in our society. And recently there was a study that Marco and I were involved in that showed differences in, in 10,000 people living in China. Those are real differences. Now, does that mean that people in China have lower lung function or is it a cumulative effect of poor air quality of nutritional effects. And so we don't know what the best way to move forward is. That I can be certain, I can tell you, that's why the, the, the recommendations are, are not as definitive as some people would have liked to see. But we are learning that genetics has a very small proportion of explaining those differences. Standing height or your sitting height, your chest size also has a very small proportion of explaining those differences. And so as an, as an interim, as Nadia mentioned, we developed something called GLI Global, which is very similar to GLI Other. And we're, we're all reevaluating our practices and accepting that we may have been wrong in recommending ethnic specific equations. And so when I talk about uncertainty, this is one of the biggest areas. So people who are normal and well in that normal range, it shouldn't matter which reference equation that you use, they'll be normal. People that are severely abnormal, that are well outside that range, it shouldn't matter which reference equation you use. Someone falls in that middle area where interpretation will be different. That's where we have to use our clinical judgment. We have to appreciate somebody's occupational exposure, somebody's lived experience and social experience and use lung function in a far more um, kind of holistic way than just saying you're above or below a threshold. Yeah, that, that, makes, that makes good sense. Um, there are several, Marco, this one is probably more up your alley. There are several tests that can be performed to assess and diagnose patients experiencing respiratory symptoms like spirometry PFT, but also peak flow measures, pheno, mepicoline challenge, et cetera. Could AI incorporate all measures for better diagnoses? There is published evidence, for example, that there is a high rate of misdiagnosis of asthma. Yeah, I think there's like 33% of all asthma patients are uh, misdiagnosed. Um, and that's a big number. So yes, AI in theory, yes, AI can incorporate all these for better measures as long as the data that are used to train the model are of, of the of the good quality. Great. Very good. Um, this is maybe a bit controversial question. How fast will gold reorganize their percent scores and base them on z-scores? I don't, I don't know. Um, yeah. I think I think it's a great question. And something that we've been getting a lot of feedback about is related to the fact that many of the ERS ATS technical standards or clinical guidelines actually don't align and talk to each other. And so there's a lot of confusion out there. You have our PFT standards are telling us one thing, asthma guidelines, gold line guidelines are, are, are contradictory to those. And so we, we are committed to working with all of the, the various clinical groups and the PFT committee on the ATS is certainly kind of making ways in doing that and helping to inform practice. 
Um, but I think this is a really big challenge in our field and something that the societies as well as all of us as individuals contributing to these reports need to get better at. So I hope soon, but these things take time. They take time. Yeah. Someone asked realistically, you know, and this is for the both of you, how quickly do you think labs will adopt using, clinicians will adopt using this new interpretation strategy? I'm going to put it right back to you, Nadia. So I think it's, we really <laughs> have to work with, with our partners in industry. Um, you know, and the feedback from the very first talk that I gave was, well, I can't do, I can't implement this until the manufacturers implement it into my reports, until they implement it into the software. And so again, I think this is an opportunity where we're going to really have to work together to make sure that these get implemented into software, into the, the standardized reports. And I think once the, the reports are updated, then people are more likely to adopt them. I will, I can absolutely appreciate and understand no one's going to be sitting there with their calculator or going onto our online calculator to do this by hand. So we really all need to work together to make this, um, to get it into the labs as fast as possible. Um, we probably have time for one last question before we close. How big of a difference should you have in Z-score to call it significant change? We used to use greater than 5% before for reporting a significant change. Um, so excellent question. So in children, um, again, we have developed an algorithm where it really depends on a number of factors. So again, intuitively, if you measure someone a week apart, their measurements should be more similar to one another than you measure somebody a year apart. And so we have an algorithm that takes into account the time interval between measurements. It takes into account the baseline starting value. And it also takes into account age because younger children, their chest walls are floppier than, than children that are post-puberty. And so we have to take age into account as well. So again, we look forward to manufacturers implementing those algorithms to make that a little bit easier. Um, generally, again, there's, there's in terms of cutoffs, your Z-score should be stable. So if you have zero for your Z-score at one visit, in theory, it should be the same at the next visit. How much change is going to depend on the factors that I just talked about as well. And in adults, um, following Z-scores, again, they should be stable. And, and I, the more that the science is coming out, um, the more that I'm convinced that FEV1Q is going to be really useful in thinking about tracking individuals over time and how far someone is from the bottom. Very good. All right, three minutes. Last question. Marco, has an AI been applied to work up um, iOS? Is there anything around that or oscillometry of any kind? Yeah, I, I read some papers there There was, uh, not by us, unfortunately. <laughs> I'm joking. No, because we tried to apply AI and literally everything with the, the pulmonary function testing and in the respiratory diagnostics. So, uh, but iOS was not uh, the application that we applied for, but I read a couple of papers um, that, that, that try to do that. All right. Very good. Is it, is it, I, I, I didn't see any of those being uh, commercially available, but. Um, yeah, I, I myself, I'm not aware of any um, airway uh, respiratory oscillometry that are out there, but of course that doesn't yeah. mean they're not. Um, I, I see, I saw J Sonia on your slide that the GLI is working on um, some equations around oscillometry. So maybe that Marco then, that's where you take the ball and run <laughs> when those we'll are see. ready. We'll see. So far we have good collaborations. So um, hopefully, hopefully we may extend the collaborations as well. Very good. I want to thank everyone for their attendance, Drs. Topolovich and Stanoyevich. Thank you so much for joining us and what a great um, presentation. So this does conclude our presentation. For those of you who remember wishing to get CRCE credits, remember to watch for an email from Vier and fill out that mandatory survey. And I just want to say thank you all for attending and enjoy your day. Thank you.